Well, greetings all. Uh, very seldom do I ever discuss anything that I really can't do. But today, let's talk about something that the Green Garden guy can't do here in Hawaii. Yeah, um, going back long time now, back 1969, maybe 1970, uh, approximately, right in there, uh, would have been the first load of kiwi fruits that really ever made it from New Zealand uh, into uh, the United States, into the Chicago area. Uh, that's why they call them kiwi fruits, <laughs> after the goofy little flightless birds down there that uh, that they name people in New Zealand after. Uh, and they're kind of round and fuzzy, you know, ah, kind of looks like a kiwi. Yeah, I remember I was shopping a produce stand there in my neighborhood uh, in uh, near Chicago, and Oh, I looked down. They had a whole case of these things imported from New Zealand. I'd never seen such a thing. It was all new to me. And, well, I've always been into tasting strange stuff. So I had to buy one. Now, wow. Boy, I'll tell you, in those days, man, oh, man, you want to talk about cost, inflation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, these were a rarity at that time. Yeah, I, We've never seen them in the United States, and um, they they were going for a buck a piece in about 1970. That was quite a bit of money to pop for, but I had to try it, so I did, and I wasn't disappointed. Yes, they they were very ripe, well grown, excellent quality kiwi, and I was hooked for life. Yep, that was it. First kiwi, never got over it. Of course. Kiwi is a subtropical fruit. Uh, it doesn't grow well in temperate climates, nor does it grow in tropical climates. <laughs> it's the space of, of countryside that it will actually produce well in. It's pretty limited. Um, you know, and it, uh, they're, um, and they're not particularly hardy. Okay, they, they will die off when the weather gets cold, yet they require some chilling um, to uh, to get them to grow in the California Bay Area we had to use uh, oh things like Hayward which were uh, uh, low chill cultivars of Kiwi yeah yeah Hayward would have been the female and I believe Vincent uh, was the most common male that was used in those areas um, and you know if you go further south from there they definitely need to use a low chill form of the plant in order to get things to yield properly but can't go too far north with them because they freeze to death easily yeah so it's a it's kind of a limited range california does almost all of this stuff well after my first taste of kiwi i was fascinated and in those days, I don't know whether it still exists, but they had what they called the Actinidia Enthusiast Society. And I joined, <laughs> yes, I, along with Northern Nut Growers and Seed Savers Exchange, Decor, Iowa, and all these things back in those days. Uh, I belonged to a lot of organizations. Uh, but the Actinidia Enthusiast was uh, uh, really was... It's special for me. I, I just adored the Kiwis. Well, I believe it would have been during Ronald Reagan's administration. Um, oh, about the time that they had the uh, glasnost and they they claimed that Reagan took down the Berlin Wall. Yeah, BS. Uh, <laughs> the Russians took it down. But it was back around that time that we opened up some trade with the Soviet Union. Oh, yeah, chickens and wheat started going that way, and various things started coming our way. Um, well, one thing that came into the country during that period of time was a whole series of extremely hardy kiwis, temperate kiwis, from Siberia. Um, they were pretty much all in the class of Actinidia colomicta, but there was also a few Actinidia arguta. Um, now, the... the uh, Fuzzy kiwi is uh, chenensi or delicosa. Uh, it's got two names. Um, either, either claims it comes from China or it's delicious, one or the other. But that's the fuzzy kiwi. Now, these are different species. Um, they are generally grouped in what we called the fuzzless kiwis. I'm sure some of you are familiar with Asai, the Japanese fuzzless self-fertile. Right, Gracie? 
Oh, you're wet. Yeah, my kitty come. <laughs> I was wondering where she is. She got her back wet here. Yeah. Coming over to see what I'm doing. Yeah, speaking of fuzzy things. <laughs> yeah, it's a fuzzy thing over there. It's my my best furry gray friend. Well, so there was a release of some unusual Soviet uh, Sumerian varieties uh, at that time. Well, belonging to Actinidian Enthusiast Organization, uh, I was able to gain access to some of the first pieces that were brought into the United States uh, at, through the society. And I took them and I planted them in a Zone 3, USDA Zone 3 in northern Wisconsin. Um, this is about as cold as Siberia. It gets cold. Um, any winter, always 20 below. Uh, most winters, 30 below. A few winters, 40 below, and once I saw 54 below zero in that zone. But we will always drop to 20 below zero at some time or another in that region of the country during any winter. Well, I acquired, a, I don't believe it was about eight or ten varieties. I believe eight of them were Kolomikta and two were Arguta forms. Um, the Arguta are less hardy than the Kolomikta. I planted them in such a way that made good sense to me. I used uh, quaking aspen uh, as a shelter because the quaking aspen uh, in the fall when the, uh, we get a cold evening there, cold night, it's crystal clear. The uh, quaking aspen, as heat is rising up underneath those trees, the leaves flutter. That's why they call them quaking aspens. Well, the fluttering leaves act like little fans to keep the air stirred underneath the trees so we don't get early frosts uh, around a grove of quaking aspen because of that. Yeah, and because they're trees is a little woody it it slows the spring growth down so things come out after frost yeah that was how i successfully grew american black walnut in zone three <laughs> if i put it out in the open hay field come a spring frost they look like burned up tomato plants but put them underneath the uh, uh, poplars and they wouldn't sprout out until after the frost was gone so i did the same thing with my actinidias and uh they were doing fine. Yes, uh, they were. They were actually being successful. They had made several winters uh, in Zone Three, Northern Wisconsin, uh, and probably hit at least 30 below zero without dying there. Uh, but then, of course, one thing leads to another. Uh, she gets fed up with the whole situation. Files for divorce. Have to sell the farm. Then the Kiwis go with it. Never saw him again. If my neighbor was smart enough, he wandered over the fence and took some cuttings for his garden. I don't know whether Matt did that or not, but yeah, they, I, I don't think the guy that bought the farm knew or cared about Actinidia. Anyway, they were surviving there. So, well. The USDA, oh, going back to about 1995, they've been worried about the fact that only California grows all our kiwis, and so they've uh, uh, been working on trying to come up with hardier strains of the plant. And actually, they did. Um, that would be, at, um, it was at the Appalachian Fruit uh, Research Station, uh, and they were working with a group of second-generation seedlings of kiwi that had come into them from Italy. Well, somewhere back around 1995 to about 2012, somewhere in that range, I don't know quite where, the uh, temperature at the research station actually dropped to uh, 5.8 uh, Fahrenheit below zero. Yeah, so they had almost six degrees below zero at the experimental station. Well, out of that, only two of the second generation kiwi seedlings from Italy survived. And it just happened that one was a female and one was a male. How convenient. Um, yeah, so they went ahead and they named the female Tango and they named the male Hombre. Good name for, <laughs> for a male kiwi, I would say. Yeah. Um, now, the, the quality of these is very similar to the Chinese fuzzy kiwi, okay? But 
Having survived nearly six degrees below zero means that these plants could probably be grown successfully by a farmer in the mid-Atlantic zone of the eastern United States, not just California. So this is kind of a big deal. Uh, it's going to expand the range of the kiwi uh, considerably. Now, I won't go too far north, but, well, I guess, you know, parts of... Oregon and Washington probably even maybe will stay within the, a reasonable temperature range where this fruit may actually be able to be grown. Um, now the, uh, the male is a non-patented uh, public domain plant and so you can acquire this with uh, no special paperwork whatsoever and begin to cultivate it the female as uh, a tango is uh, it's a patented okay and so it, there you're going to have to uh, apply for proper paperwork if you're a nursery or a farmer to handle these plants uh, but the government wants you to have them that's the whole point here and uh, so if you're looking for more info on this and you want to get into it, uh, you're going to go to AFRS at USDA.gov. That would be the uh, Appalachian Fruit Research Station, AFRS. Yeah, they're the guys that got them. They got all the information on it. Um, now, there's, far as I know at the moment, there are no commercial nurseries out there producing this stock. The USDA is looking for commercial nurseries to do such a thing. And so you won't be able to run right out and buy these off of your, uh, uh, your Gurney's catalog. You know, it's not going to happen right away. Sooner or later, you probably will. This is pretty exciting and they should start showing up. It's going to take a few years because you take two plants that survived and begin cultivating them and propagating so you have enough plants to share with everybody in the mid-atlantic zone that takes a few years so it's gonna be a little while this is the way it always is the news about the new plants comes out years <laughs> ahead of the release and because i'm reading news from the usda what i'm giving you here is years ahead now if you are a farmer and interested in cropping these kiwi, the USDA wants to talk to you. Yes. Or if you are a nursery, whether it be, you know, wholesale or retail, whatever you do, um, provided you do propagation and there, they want to talk to you. <laughs> you know, you will have to get the, the, the patent permit uh, if you intend to grow the female plant. But, yeah. I, I think it's pretty exciting because previously we could grow the uh, Colomitas or the Argutas in colder climates, but they don't have the appeal. Um, the colors are funny. They, these, yeah, these plants come in odd fruit colors, you know, like yellow, purple, and so on. Um, and then uh, the most all are fuzzless, and so they're, and they're small. You know, Colomitas are about like so i guess uh a sigh a little bit bigger uh, th that is the one fuzzless arguta that i do have uh experience with in california uh, sadly there's a plant where we could grow the fuzzy kiwi in the bay area but a sigh it doesn't like heat it wants more winter chilling and it doesn't like drought and so if you live somewhere in Oregon, maybe where it rains pretty good and it never gets very, very hot, this plant will probably thrive for you. Aloha, folks. Y'all hang loose and thanks for listening.